Hi, just a follow up video to this HP 1740A 100MHz dual channel analog uh, oscilloscope and the uh, repair of this thing. And uh, where we got to uh, last time was that we found that once we took the case off this thing, it basically would not fail except for one very small uh, capture that I got by coincidence as I was tweeting a uh, photo where all of the power rails, five different power rails on the output of the secondary uh, linear uh, transformer, this is in a switch mode uh, converter supply, so five different linear rails all dropped uh, at once. And well, I left the thing for like at least four hours. It might have been closer to five hours or something like that. Still would not fail. So it's either a, a thermal problem where the unit, where because the uh, the case is now off this thing, the heat can escape. It can't build up inside, and the thing is not uh, is upside down now. So if it is something to do with the power supply, for example, or uh, something on the bottom like this board here, then uh, you know the heat doesn't sort of build up inside that uh, case. But it may not be a thermal problem. It may actually be a mechanical uh, issue. So let me actually explain on the schematic here what I'm talking about. But before we do that, um, if you're trying to capture intermittent faults, which I wasn't here, uh, by the way, because I, you know, I thought it'd just sit there for an hour and then just fail. I wanted to see what the rails did, but I didn't know it would have that like intermittent uh, you know, a dropout like I uh, captured by accident. So if you want to do that with your meters, you hook them up and you use your min max mode. So that's what I've done on these four meters here. And I've left the thing once again for another like hour or so. And I haven't been able to capture everything, anything at all before this thing uh, was easily failing within the hour. And it was fairly uh, repeatable at that, but I haven't put the case back on and everything. Anyway, I've set them to min max mode so it'll capture uh, any transients which uh, go low. So I've got it display in the minimum at the moment, but it's always, it's in min-max record mode, all of these meters, even this old Fluke 27 um, has it, and I'm actually displaying the minimum. So maybe I can actually, uh, I don't know, simulate a mains brownout or uh, something just by uh, wiggling the power cord or something like that, perhaps. Here we go, I'll give it a go, and they'll all uh, jump down. Just a uh, trap for young players, if you've got a negative rail like this, you don't want to set it to minimum like I've set this one. If you're looking to get brownouts and drops in the voltage, you've got to set this one to maximum because it's a negative voltage, so it'll go up towards zero effectively. So, you know, so it's actually maximum. So, I don't know, let me see if I can wiggle this mains lead on the input. I can switch it off and on, but that's a, you know, I want to get like a, hey, there we go. There we go. I did something. There we go. Drop down. There we go. So that was just by uh, wiggling the mains lead on the input. So we're able to uh, capture that. Now, as I said in the previous video, looking at uh, the schematic for the main power supply board, you can see it's a, it's basically a standard linear transformer. It's got multiple isolated uh, taps, two, four, six different uh, taps here, all going to standard bridge rectifier, full wave bridge rectifiers, and then the big uh, filter caps, the big old ones from us. Uh, Sprague and Mallory, I think they are. Um, anyway, but yeah, we've got a, um, a linear regulator chip, you know, pass transistor mounted on the back, all kind of, you know, standard stuff. But basically, I'm measuring the output of um, most of these. I'm measuring five. Um, I think we've got six taps here. Anyway, I'm measuring five main rails here, and they all dropped. According to that photo, even though I have not been able to reproduce it yet, but we did actually capture that drop. So you've got to assume what can drag all five rails after the linear regulators down. As I said, they've each one's got individual current limit in here, a current limit output resistor, and it's got current limit in inside the chip, whatever uh, chip that is, I'm not sure, but it doesn't matter. Um, how would you drag all the output of all those linear regulators low? Well, the most obvious uh, thing, like, because if you just shorted out one here, for example, even if, this, say, this diode bridge rectifier shorted out or did something weird, something, you know, you loaded it down, didn't have any protection, etc. I don't know, the cap was doing something weird. You know, it's unlikely to drag down any of the others because of the low impedance source through the transformer. It's just not going to affect it, um, these other channels. So, odds on, it's got to be something on the primary side which is causing a dropout, because then anything that happens on the primary side, if it can't deliver enough power, 
uh, then the outputs here, because these are all drawing, I don't know how much power this scope draws, you know, I don't know, 10, 20 watts or something, right? You know, it's a reasonable amount of power, okay? So if this, this primary side, for some reason, cannot deliver that power, all of these outputs are likely to drop. Well, the outputs, the outputs of the linear regulator here, but, you know, obviously the outputs of the uh, transformer will drop, and then, bingo, it'll go through to the linear outputs. So the first thing I would suspect is something on the primary side of this transformer, and just forget what's going on down here with these couple of transistors. This is just uh, some interface uh, stuff for the two B and Cs, the gating outputs, um, the maiden delay gating outputs on the rear panel. They just happen to use those as a convenient uh, jumping from one board to the other because the board happened to be there, so they're mounted on there, and that doesn't matter. So that's got nothing to do with uh, this main side, and the main side is incredibly simple. We've got a, an IEC uh, mains input connector here, uh, one amp uh, fuse on the input, and then we've got our switch, okay, that's our front panel uh, line switch on the front panel, and then we've got a the voltage selection switches, which is on the base of the unit, down in here, and uh, and then uh, then you've got some socket uh, wiring contacts. You've got your uh, PCB connector going off to here. So I'm suspecting possible. My first point of call would either be the front panel main switch or the main selection switch here, because these are you've got to remember these are like what 30. This is 1980. Okay, so this is a 35 year old scope. So these are 35 year old switches, 35 year old contacts on there, and contacts can uh, pit and corrode over time with uh, use. Uh, for example, so if the contacts are pitted and they can and because they've got power, reasonably you know not super high power flowing through it, right? We're only talking 10 or 20 watts or whatever this scope uh, takes, but it's enough current to cause a potential issue. So if the, if the contacts either in here or maybe the front panel main switch are pitted, then it could potentially have you know, change while like under uh, time, maybe it heats up a little bit, maybe it's got a little bit of high resistance and then slowly heats up inside until some, you know, something happens on the surface contact of the switches in here which then um, it causes not to be able to deliver enough power to the transformer, so all the outputs are going to drop. That's the first thing I want to check. So yeah, you could go, you know, right down the rabbit hole trying to uh, look at all the other boards in the thing and whatever's hooked onto the output of all of these uh, channels here, see if one of them's loading down, and you could chase that rabbit hole, but I think that's pretty foolish because they all seem to drop. So. This, I think, definitely worth looking at. So I think if you didn't have a look around here first, you were, you know, going for a wander down the garden path. Now, the problem with this is, is I cannot reproduce the fault. So what I'll, I'll probably have to do first, maybe off camera, is to disconnect all the multimeters, put the covers back on, run the thing for an hour, and see if I can actually reproduce the problem. But anyway, there is our uh, mains input voltage selection. So there's some, like, PCB contact switches under there. It looks like we might be able to take that off and inspect it, but they're probably like, uh, you know, PCB solder connectors on there. And yeah, I can go and, you know, it's probably almost impossible to expect, uh, inspect because they're probably sealed switches in there. We'll have a look in a second, but um, yeah, I could go and spray some, you know, contact cleaner in them, in, in those, but the problem is if I can't reproduce the fault, how do I know that I fixed it? So, yeah, we have to try and reproduce the fault first before we go spray the contacts. It's, all, it's great to have this theory that it's probably something to do with the uh, contacts somewhere. It's not likely to be the uh, board to board, but you might take those out, have a look at the contacts on there, just as a matter of course, though. We got one! I got lucky! I just <laughs> switched it. Um, I just disconnected the mains power cord out the back, and then reconnected it and bingo look I on the uh, screen down here oh it's hard to uh, why bother setting up another camera shot but have a look it's uh, like yeah like there is nothing I can't adjust that we're getting you know just that fixed line and all of the rails all the rails are low look at that why hmm okay so these aren't in min max anymore okay so I'm going to wiggle that mains cord and see 
But the problem is, no, so I'm wiggling the mains input connector. Okay, so it's not that. Let me show you that. I'll show you my wiggling. Let's wiggle the front panel line switch. Give that a little bit of a, can you see that? I'm giving that a bit of a, bit of a jiggle. There we go. Nothing doing down in there. I'll get my isolated uh, prodder. Um, well, these are all secondary, so no drama there. Give those a bit of a, bit of a wiggle. These are the main, mains connectors. Give those a wiggle. And main switches. Those voltage selection switches, although I'm only hitting the top. Maybe I can hit the board. Hmm. Nope. Nothing. It's permanently low. So here we go. I will uh, repower. Let me repower with the back here. There's all the rails dropping. Oh, hey, look. Has it permanently failed now? Excellent. Oh, that's what we want. That's what we want. Permanent failure. You bloody ripper. Now we're getting somewhere. Murphy's on his uh, lunch break, I think. All right, so let's test our primary uh, side theory here. The way we can do that is take, for example, just one of the rails. Uh, we'll do them one at a time, otherwise I'll need like 10 multimeters. Let's take the 5 volt output here. Okay, so the 5 volt output goes through this pass transistor and it goes to this side to plus 9.5 volts there to this 50, C11, this 5300 microfarad cap on the output of this full wave bridge rectifier. So if this doesn't measure 9 volts, well, it actually says 9 volts here and then 9.5 volts there. Eh, a little discrepancy. Anyway, if it doesn't measure around about 9 volts, uh, or, you know, significantly higher than the 5 volts because the dropout voltage of the pass transistor here, so let's assume in, say, it's a 2 volt maximum uh, dropout voltage, it's going to need at least 7 volts to regulate uh, this thing. So if it's not at least, you know, around, it should be around about that 9 volt figure. If it's not, then we know, bingo, the primary side... Uh, is not being able to supply enough power on that particular winding and most likely on all the other windings as well. So here we go. I've got another meter here set up across that 5300 microfarad uh, cap down in there. It's still got some uh, charge on. It hasn't been able to bleed it off because they haven't got a bleeder resistor on there. So the all the, you know, the regulator I see is the pass transistors is switched off and there's still some charge there. Anyway, so let's power it on. Hopefully it still fails. Um, so let's power it still. Oh, oh, it's working. Nine volts. You bastard. Oh, no, no. Hang on. No, seven volts. You saw it. Here we go. There we go. It's dropping. So there's our five volt rail. There's our five volt rail. 4.2 volts. No wonder. You know, it's, it. well, actually, 0.2 volts regulation is uh, pretty good, actually. So, uh, yeah. But look, so it's dropped. And all the other uh, rails have dropped as well. But you can see that the output of the full wave bridge rectifier, and it's failed of course, um, and so the output of the full wave bridge rectifier is, it cannot, you know, is, is dropped. So that means our pri it's most likely our primary side of the transformer cannot supply enough power. Let me check one of the other rails. Okay, I've now hooked it up to our 6,000 microfarad cap. That's for our plus 15 volt regulated output. Uh, the uh, output of the bridge rectifier on that cap as we should read on here, it should be about 21 volts or thereabouts. So let's power it on. Yep, it's failed again. Oh, this is repeatable. Hey, no, we're still getting. Look at that. That's interesting. Whoa, there you go. I lost that bit. That's enough. That is more than enough to give our regulated 15 volts output. But we're not getting our regulated 15 volts output. So that's really interesting. Hmm. And there we go, that's interesting. This is the negative uh, rail, it shows positive there. I've hooked it up back to the front. Uh, Murphy got me. Anyway, that's the negative rail. So we're looking at negative 22 volts, so that's correct as well. I wow, I really lost that bet. Um, so, but our negative rail is minus 12, but it's got more than enough voltage to regulate it. It's got the regular output voltage expected from that uh, full wave bridge rectifier.
And let's try the 42 volt uh, rail as well. I've got it across the 500 mic uh, 75 volt cap. Should be about 55 volts according to the rail. And yeah, but we're all good again. Bloody hell. Come on, fail, fail. Come on, you can do it. You can fail, come on. And there we go, it's failed, but it's at 60 volts. So it's actually jumped up, which seems to, you know, like there's less load on there. So yeah, that's interesting, but we lose regulation. So maybe there's something that's tying maybe an overload on the five volt rail, perhaps into, uh, well, that causes a uh, drop out of regulation of the other channels. Hmm, but, the bridge rectifier outputs, the, all the other ones are fine. It's only the five volt rail. I can actually whack that one back. What was it, this big one here? There we go. No, hang on, no, it was this one here, was it? I can never remember. Yeah, there we go, four volts. No good whatsoever. And I'm just having a look at the uh, ripple on the five volt rail here and uh, we're on uh, two volts per division and as you can see it's just over that uh, yeah that four volts uh, that we can see over there I haven't got the multimeter on the uh, rail but yeah it's you know that 4.2 uh, volts or whatever we were seeing before and the ripple is um, basically bugger all look at that the main output voltage has dropped and by the way if you're going to uh, scope probe these things i've done a whole video on uh, mains ground earth referencing and you're probably better off for using an isolation uh, transformer when you're testing something like this um, or just make sure your ground reference point for your probe is actually chassis uh, ground otherwise you can blow the ass out of your um, scope and or your product okay i'm trying to make it come good now um but it's no it's not going to come good um but you know it's not like the capacitor has failed and then otherwise we'd see a huge amount of ripple on here because it should be what normally uh nine volts or whatever so you know two four six eight you know it should be like up here and you know if the cap was uh troublesome we'd see you know a large amount of ripple but no we're seeing hardly any ripple on there at all so it's it must be drawing um, excess current, and it's it's just dragging that down. The um, output winding uh, can't provide enough power. So what we need to do now is go back to our schematic and have a closer look at what's happening here. Um, because what we've been doing up until now, we didn't like sit down there and analyze all how the power supply worked, made a few assumptions, and it was actually quite reasonable to suspect the primary side because all of our outputs uh, dropped. And so we did the right thing. We said we came up with a quite plausible theory about the primary side here. We went about testing it by, and we actually found that our five volt, the output of our bridge rectifier here on our five volt rail, this nine volts, um, actually dropped right down. Okay. So that seemed to confirm that theory. But then when I went to double check, always double check this. Okay. Don't assume anything. So I, I went and measured the other rails here and these other rails weren't being dragged down. So that fact basically ruled out our primary side theory, high impedance primary side dragging everything down on these secondaries. So we have to go check the rest of the circuit and see what's what. Okay, so what we've got here is our three, let, let's just look at this, like ignore all these complicated looking ones with the transistors up top. Let's just like concentrate on what's happening to the five volt and the plus minus 15 volt rails here. Now, so we've got three regulator ICs here, okay? And, but when you actually look closer at these, okay? This one here is the one for the plus five volt rail. Uh, sorry, plus 15 volt rail okay so we've got our plus 22 volts coming in here and we measured uh that that it was still 22 volts yet our output was actually being dragged down now this looks a uh, fairly typical look here's our output here our plus 15 well there we go sorry you can't see that but here there it is our plus 15 volt output here and we've got our um our look we've got a voltage adjustment pot here for the 15 volts so we've got our typical output voltage divider feeding back and actually uh into our uh regulator here using this external pass transistor and that is a very very typical 
um, you know, voltage regulator. But we're, we know we're measuring 22 volts here, but we're not getting 15 volts out of here. Why? But more interestingly, let's take a look at another one down here. Okay, this is the negative 15 volt one. Where is, where are the feedback resistors from this, uh, my, from this negative output rail? Look, aha, here's our feedback resistors. Look, it's reference to the 15 volt rail, the plus 15 volt rail here. So this is not independent. It actually relies on the fact that this 15 volt rail is set correctly. And then if you go look at the 5 volt voltage regulator, aha, right, here's our output here, here's our output current sense resistor, here's our series pass transistor. Where is the voltage reference coming from? Bingo, the plus 15 volt rail again. So if that plus 15 volt rail drags down, of course it'll drag down the 5 volt rail, of course it'll drag down the negative 15 volt rail. So it looks like the all the rails there are referenced to that plus 15 volts output. And of course, wouldn't you know it, if you actually go and read the theory of operation of this thing, it tells you exactly that. Look at this, all voltages, plus 5, 43, 120, plus uh, minus 15, what we've been measuring, and the high voltage are reference to the plus 15 volt supply. Oh, so of course, it, so it must be made operational first. The supplies are current limiting type, as, as we've seen. They've got those current limit resistors. So any excessive loading on the vertical, horizontal, etc., will cause the supply to read 20 to 30 percent low, and that's what we've been seeing. So of course, they're going to. Uh, it's going to drag down all of the rails. Okay, so what it actually tells you to do in the troubleshooting procedure and what's obvious is to actually remove this board here which connects the output of the uh, power supply here to all the other boards here, the horizontal and the uh, vertical boards. And well, that's a really, that's really is very nice. It just uh, slips out like that because uh, we've got card edge connectors on here. They all look in great condition. There's no, uh, no corrosion at all on there. Everything's beautifully gold plated. It'd be very thick gold plating too top notch no worries whatsoever and I'm looking at the rails and of course they're all bang on I might just leave it for a while and see if it fails but I suspect no that there's something that's dragging down one of those rails and of course with no horizontal and no vertical what do we get <laughs> we get a dot straight in the middle because it ain't driving it left right up down or wherever and you can actually see the high voltage output here still connected to the board down here. So we still drive all our high voltage stuff. We're still driving our uh, CRT and uh, everything else. It's just that we're not connected through to our horizontal and our vertical boards here. So what we're doing now is just uh, checking to see if it's the horizontal or the vertical boards uh, at fault here. See if our problem returns. But... As we've, as we've been seeing here, these intermittent faults are a pain in the ass because you don't know whether or not you're just getting lucky and the fault's not showing up. It could be in the high voltage uh, section, which is still being uh, uh, powered from here. As I said, it could still be in there, but, you know, there could be uh, some reason why it's not uh, showing. You know, Murphy will get you every time. So, it, you know, just because we could leave it here for an hour and it might still be good, but that doesn't actually prove anything as such. This is why intermittent failures are such a pain in the ass, and you can waste a lot of time. You can go down a lot of, uh, you know, chasing a lot of red herrings down the rabbit hole, and well, yeah. Uh, so, but eh, it's not failing so far. So, I don't know. You you name the odds of the uh, high voltage power supply section being at fault. I, I suspect it's not. I suspect it's on I, the vertical or the horizontal sections. And that suspicion is backed up by, uh, remember, our plus 5 volt rail is the one that actually went down here. And the output of this bridge rectifier was really loaded down. And, by the way, it was that pass transistor that was getting hot and this uh, voltage regulator here, uh, U2. I've actually checked the position on that on the component overlay and it was that one that was getting hot for that 5 volt rail. So our 5 volt rail over here, uh, we've got assembly A14 and it looks like our 5 volt rail doesn't go anywhere else. So I'm suspecting A14 over here. I don't know what that is. We'll have to have a look.
Ah, oh, well, there you go, that doesn't help. Here's our power supply up here. This is the interconnecting board, the A14 interconnect we just uh, physically removed. And that plus 5 volts comes out of the power supply and goes off to both the horizontal sweep assembly and also to the vertical preamp assembly. So it could be either one of those, horizontal or vertical. Well, thanks for that. And if we have a look at this uh, rather complex looking interconnection diagram, our low voltage power supply here, our plus 5 volt output here, as we saw, it goes off to the horizontal assembly down here, and it also goes off to the vertical assembly in here. But then the plus 5 volts from the vertical assembly also goes over uh, to here as well. There's, I, you know, the horizontal's pretty boring. There's not much doing in the horizontal. So I more... Just from a sheer odds point of view, I think there's more likely to be stuff happening in the vertical channel. So I'm more suspecting the uh, the vertical uh, side of thing, the vertical board than the horizontal board. But eh, I mean, you know, it's just guessing, really. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is just have a quick check of the uh, five volt rail output current and uh, we don't have to get in and break the circuit with our multimeter to measure the current at all because we've got ourselves a current limiting resistor here this one ohm resistor r30 here we can just measure the voltage across that and hopefully the voltage across it when it's not failed and then wait until it fails and then see if the uh, voltage increases i.e the current increases so let's give that a burl there we go, that's our 1 ohm current shunt resistor. I'm using these uh, parrot clips in there. Um, I love through hole parts like this, troubleshooting through hole parts, because you can get in there with your little easy hooks or your parrot clips or whatever, or your, even your alligator clips, and actually clip on to the components. You don't have to solder on, you don't have to do anything. It's really easy. So we'll power it on. Yeah, we're working, and we're getting uh, point. 2.5 volts there, so we're looking at, uh, you know, 250 milliamps on the 5 volt rail. I'll just sit here, uh, wait for it to fail. Hopefully it was failing before within a few minutes, so hopefully. Fingers crossed. Oh, there we go. There we go. 4 volts. It's dropping. Our current's actually going down. Yes, I've got it hooked up uh, backwards. I didn't know which way it went, so it's... Yeah. But, no, our current hasn't increased. But... Look, our current hasn't increased, but the voltage, that's 2 volts per division. So our AC output, our rectified output tap has certainly dropped. Look at that. There we go. I've powered it back up. I've uh, put the probes around the right way. So 250 milliamps, and there's our normal, there's our normal uh, ripple um, after our full wave bridge rectifier. So 2, 4, 6. Look, look, slowly. Oh, you see it drop. Did that drop, or was that just my imagination? Anyway, two, four, six. Oh, did we get a glitch there? Two, four, six, and then whoa, wait, no, that's that's one sick puppy. Look at that. But our current, you'll notice, our current did not increase, so it's not like it's being overloaded. Bingo. And just as a matter of course, I'm going to check the connections on the uh, uh, transformer input there. They look they look pretty darn good. No corrosion or anything on those. So, based on Kirchhoff's current law, what can be, can be happening here? Where can, if it is uh, excess current, where can it be going? So, say for example, there's excess uh, current on the output of this bridge rectifier, and it, and it is actually dragging this rail down, and this diode bridge and this uh, tap here can't, uh, can't supply uh, the power required. Where's it going? Well... It's not going through here, it's not going out of here, because here's our current sense resistor. It can, there's only two places it can be going. One is somehow through the base of this transistor into uh, our, I think, believe it's an LM723 um, voltage regulator here, or it's going around here once again into a current limit pin. It doesn't seem likely at all. We've measured the voltage across here. There is no excess current flowing out there, so it can only flow there, or there. Um, so it can't go anywhere else. So what's happening here? Well, as I said, if that capacity, if that was a bad capacitor, this 5300 microfarad cap, if that was, you know, bad as well, it's, you know, 35 years, 30 years old or whatever it is, 35, is it? Um, yeah, you'd certainly suspect that. But you'd see a lot, a huge amount of excess ripple. That's what I would have expected. 
So I'm starting to suspect either this um, transformer tap, which is highly unlikely, the interconnects in here, which is uh, plausible, just like we had on the primary side. We thought maybe there's a, you know, some sort of interconnect issue or the diode bridge. And the capacitor one we can prove, I'm just whacking a 22, I think it's a 2200 microfarad, uh, 60 odd volt across the uh, rail there. And well, let's have a look at our ripple as well. And watch it, okay, everything's working hunky-dory at the moment, but I suspect this puppy is going to fail. And yeah, the scope uh, scope still works, so everything's fine. I think we'll start, oh, wait, did, did that just drop or was that my, no, look, it's jumping around. It's jumping around. Remember, this is the voltage across that uh, uh, full wave rectified uh, capacitor there. So I think if we wait, I reckon it's going to drop and do exactly the same thing as before. I am, yep, there we go. It's dropped. Bam. Uh, voltage across there. 4.4 uh, volts. Our voltage, our, our 5 volt rail, the output of the voltage regulator, 4.1. Bingo. Even with the extra cap on there. So it ain't the cap. Now, you wouldn't know what's really handy about having these transistors on the back and these uh, connectors going straight onto the pins. Because these are identical uh, series pass transistors, we can swap them. This, is, uh, this one here is the one for our uh, 5 volt channel that we're looking at here. But we can just swap it with this one here. So that's what I've done. Bought the, the wires are just long enough on an angle to get over there and plug in. So we can see if the fault stays with the transistors swapped over, we know there's not a problem with the tranny in some weird way, shape, or form. Okay, it's still working, and, uh, oops, sorry, forgot to turn that back on. It's just discharging that cap, and our ripple, I'm just, it's jumping around here. I reckon she'll, uh, fail, yep, there we go, failed again. Not the transistor, not that I expected it to, but hey, because we can swap it, very quick, easy test to do. Okay, now what I've got is I'm just measuring the uh, transformer output tap there. We're getting, uh, can you see that? 9 volts AC there. And uh, let's wait until, see if we get a failure. I'll switch this back, sorry. I, uh, I moved that a little bit. Come on, there we go. Wait, there we go. Bingo, we're still getting, look, it's gone back up. So that meant we're still getting the AC out of that uh, transformer. No problems whatsoever. And because there's, looks like there's less load on it. Look, so what's left? Diode bridge. That diode bridge down there is our culprit because I was measuring on uh, pin seven and eight here. Pin one starts over here, goes straight into that diode bridge. So I'm suspecting that puppy, but I do stand corrected. It could potentially still be like the solder joint on those pins or maybe the connection inside there but I can't really see any problem in there it looks really good uh, it could be you know it could be a dry joint on the bottom of this connector or the uh, diode bridge itself it may not be the diode bridge it could certainly be an old-fashioned dry joint now I was about to say this is actually uh, really quite easy to uh, get out because of the uh, the wire into the uh, pass transistors on the back, just pull those off, couple of these, disconnect the uh, mains here, disconnect the secondary, uh, take off the plate there, there's a couple of wires in there for our mains input, um, there's our mains uh, voltage selection switches for those uh, fanboys, but there is two screws going to th that there, that uh, there's a bottom mount uh, that's the mains power switch right there, which is no surprise because here's the mains input. Um, and there's a shaft which comes all the way on the bottom of the board and connects to there. So, oh, and I've got to disconnect, carefully disconnect uh, this connector here through to the bottom board. I've done that and um, I think it sort of, yeah, I don't know how that attaches under there because there's the whole high voltage um, supply on the back of that. So, geez, I don't know. Well, I figured it out. Uh, I sort of moved this slight, I've disconnected this main connector down here. I can move it just like half, like half a centimeter towards the front panel here. And then once I've got it on the front panel, ta-da, there's the line switch. And the line switch is actually square, but it's protruding enough that it now lets me 
unscrew it. Ta-da! Look at that. So I can unscrew the shaft from the uh, main switch on the back. This is all very, very clever. And by the way, yes, I did uh, eventually um, figure out that uh, this is actually explained in the manual. Doll. So bingo, this now with perhaps some difficulty, hmm, should actually come out somehow. Yeah. Well, looky what we have here. Look at those pins. Can I wiggle those from the bottom? Ah, not a huge amount. But look at those dry joints. Dry as a dead dingo's donger. But the funny thing is, that's not the one that I'm suspecting, okay? This is actually CR3, I think it is, which is the uh, flood gun, the high voltage uh, flood gun uh, tap, which I wasn't looking at. Um, this is the one that I'm interested in. That's the uh, that's that tap for the five volt rail, but that looks that looks okay. So yeah, I don't know. Anyway, so I'm not sure if I caused that problem by uh, wiggling the connector out. I I don't know. Um, but geez, I'm certainly going to fix it up. No dry. Uh, this here is the diode. No, sorry, this one is the diode bridge we're interested in. Um, so yeah, I'm going to replace that diode bridge as a matter of course, that's for the, uh, 5 volt rail. And also these ones on the other end too, they might show up really well on the camera here, but to the naked eye, they look like good joints. I had to look at those under the, uh, Mantis microscope. The others look good. These ones also, these two here. I'm not sure if this will show up on camera. It's hard to see on the camcorder LCD here, but, uh, these... Ones will, these ones also have uh, cracks in them, but the one we're interested in, this one here, looks to be good, but I'm going to re-solder this whole damn connector, just as a matter of course. And I desoldered that suspect diode bridge, and it's interesting to note, no solder has flowed through to the top side of the component there, like they have for the other components. Look, all the other components, solder has uh, fed through, no problems at all. But on that diode bridge, it suspiciously hasn't. I think I'm going to go through and re-solder all the diode bridges. It might not be anything wrong with the diode bridge, but I will replace it uh, with a uh, new one, or a new old stock, um, as a matter of course. And that diode bridge wasn't alone either. It looks like practically all of them are going to have that same issue. None of the solder has flown through. And granted, that shouldn't be a problem, but you're relying on the through hole um, plating of the um, PCB itself. And you'll notice that, you know, most of them have all the traces on the top half. If I flip it over, you'll see that very, very little is actually on the bottom there. So you've got to rely on all that top half connection right through the uh, vias there. That's yeah, asking for it, especially after 35 years. So that might not be a dodgy uh, diode bridge at all. By the way, uh, the pad fell off in the uh, repair there. I was using a reasonable temperature, but eh, it just came off. So, you know, 35 year old PCB, meh. But all of the, most of the connections look all for that diode bridge, three for that one, three for that one, three for the uh, five volt one under interest two, and all of the connections for that that we saw some really dodgy dry joints on. I mean, you know, completely cracked, right? Dry as a dead dingo's donger. Um, every single one of those connects to the positive side. So if we had no solder flow through on these dire bridges, you've got to assume that we had no solder flow through on those. I didn't actually physically remove it and uh, check it, but I uh, uh, sucked them all out. It wouldn't sort of budge. There was some, you know, it's quite hard to get these sort of things out uh, sometimes depending on the hole size, but I uh, re-soldered them uh, as a matter of uh, course and um, all of the dio bridges. So yes, I did replace the one diode bridge on the uh, top side there. There it is. I replaced that puppy there, but I probably didn't have to. I suspect there was... Now, looking at those joints, I don't think there was much wrong with those um, di that diode bridge at all. I suspect it's just 35-year-old solder joint problems. And um, this problem has probably been sitting in there waiting to happen 
for 35 years. Not adequate solder th flow through like they got on these parts here. Look, all the other parts, no problems at all. But maybe these higher thermal mass ones, or maybe they were soldered separate, or I don't know what the deal is. Um, they had no flow through whatsoever, and maybe the connector too. So anyway, resoldered it all. Let's whack it back in. Okay, let's power it on and see what we get. I've only hooked up the uh, 15 volt rail, but uh, oh, helps if I plug it in. Plugged in, we're getting four or five volts, and we're getting our 9.8. Everything's hunky-dory. Now, all we've got to do is wait, but I suspect we've fixed it. And I'll tell you what, it seems to be the diode bridge, actually. I've had this thing jumping around. I've just got it uh, tested here. I'm supposed to be drawing like a half amp uh, load from this puppy. And um, and it's it was like five volts before, and it's not it's just dropped it's just dropped and it was actually jumped back i'm probably murphy means i'm probably not going to be able to get it to uh jump back come on damn you come on anyway i reckon there's something thermally wrong with the uh with the you know the diodes inside this thing and that's probably a first i don't think i've ever like i've seen diode bridges blow but not ones that sort of you know um intermittent thermally fail like that so yeah, I'll see if I can nab it though. There we go. I got it. This is what it's normally like. Okay, and hopefully we'll just see it suddenly jump. Bingo! Hey, just saw it. Gotcha. There you go. It just jumped down. And if we let it uh, cool down, it actually recovers and it's repeatable. The bloody diode bridge. Unbelievable. So there you have it, the EV blog curse has been lifted, where I either, when I get repair uh, stuff like this, it's either so incredibly simple to fix, or it's BR, beyond economical repair, and, uh, you know, too complicated and expensive to fix, but this one, fantastic, I hope you enjoyed a look at uh, how I trace down to the bloody diode bridge, do you believe it, and potentially uh, some solder joint um, issues as well. Unbelievable. I don't think I've ever seen a diode bridge fail intermittently like that. Usually these, you know, diode bridges, yeah, they fail, but they fa usually fail open like that. And, well, these ones, this was failing uh, not so much like open. If it failed open, then it would have been fairly easy to uh, find that we weren't getting any voltage out and stuff like that. But because this uh, uh, thing had a quite unusual uh, power supply arrangement in that all the uh, voltage rail references were actually tied to the one 15 volt reference Then if the 5 volt one went down and there's all the other circuitry it by some mechanism I haven't gone in and you know investigated the whole thing maybe through another board or something like that can actually drag um, The other the 15 volt rail down and then the 15 volt rail drags down all the other rails as well, and you would have actually noticed that all of them are uh, dropped by exactly the same uh, same percentage as well. So that sort of you know clued in that they're all tied into the single 15 volt rail. But that was a fascinating troubleshooting look at like a power supply fault, right? Really, really simple, but because it failed in a very subtle and intermittent way, you saw how I actually got a little bit lucky here in terms of that. Uh, it did actually play ball in the end and actually failed pretty much on cue and I could power it up, wait a minute, it'd fail. But it didn't do that uh, the first time I played with it in my first video. It was, you know, sitting there for four or five hours and wasn't doing a thing. So if it doesn't fail, and well, we came up with, a, you know, a couple of theories. The primary side seemed like a, a reasonable uh, theory to check. And I um, it was lucky that I went in and double checked that, of course, to make sure... Uh, that the other t voltage taps had actually uh, dropped as well as the 5 volt uh, one I saw because if I did that I might have gone off and you know tried to look for some short and by the way if I followed the troubleshooting procedure in this thing I might have to uh, take a uh, capture of it and uh, show you it basically implies I think I read it out there I did show it before it says that uh, the horizontal if they all drop by 20% or whatever exactly what we saw here right all the rails drop then you know they said oh the horizontal the vertical you know it's likely to be 
in a fault like that. So if you were strictly following the troubleshooting guide, you may have gone down that rabbit hole of thinking, oh, there's some sort of overload on the uh, horizontal or the vertical boards. And uh, it's lucky that I actually, well, it's not lucky. I deliberately went in there and went, no, before I do that, I'll go in and check that uh, check the current. It's worth checking the current, double checking, checking things before you go down that rabbit hole, chasing all those red herrings where you think it might be. You know, you might have fixed 10 of these before and go, oh yeah, it's been the vertical board or whatever. I actually had um, a few people uh, email me um, since uh, the first video on, they said, oh yeah, I've seen this. It's, you know, the vertical board or it's this or it's that and stuff like that. And nobody, nobody picked a diode bridge and uh, potentially some uh, dodgy dry solder joints. Dry as a dead dingo's donger. Those things were amazing. And typically you'd start out with uh, troubleshooting something like this with a visual inspection, but you can't visually inspect those uh, joints that we saw in there until you take out the whole board. So we only had the measurement, uh, you know, just take some measurements to sort of see where we led. So. I hope you like that troubleshooting. I could have made this video shorter. Sorry, it's been like 45 minutes or something, the second one, uh, because it's been going for like an hour. I just edited the uh, footage and it was like 40 minutes worth. So I've been yapping on for another five. Sorry, at least, maybe 10. But we really got lucky with this puppy that it was such an obscure fault that, you know, you're not very likely to see something like this. Yeah, intermittent faults are, you know, happen all the time, but usually something, you know, like that uh, dry crack joint, it'd be, you know, either a physical flex thing, you might be able to, you know, flex the board, just might have saw, oh, I was poking around with the poker, it, it didn't actually come and go then, which indicates that probably wasn't the problem, and end up being an obscure thermal issue that didn't just, open, you know, fail open, it failed sort of high impedance which was a different thing, which made it look like, and it, you know, it could have led you down the garden path. You could have, I could have easily wasted a lot of hours on this uh, scope before eventually finding something like this. And that's the problem with bloody intermittent failures. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. And there's probably people who are saying, oh, geez, Dave, that was, that was pretty easy. It was just a bloody power supply. Why didn't you find that in five minutes? Well, I, Basically, it did not take as long as what you see here. I was waffling on and, you know, going through what was, talking through what was in my head and stuff like that. It might have been like an hour's worth of troubleshooting video, but in reality, if I didn't have the camera on and I was just working on this, it, it was probably 10, 15 minutes worth of work. So it's, you know, it's probably not, it, it took me longer, I think, to get the board out and then repair it, clean it up and put it back in than it did to, actually find the fault in the end. So it was a pretty quick repair in the scheme of things. So what are some quick lessons from this one? Well, always measure your voltages. Thou shall measure voltages, golden rule of troubleshooting. Don't assume something's overloaded, actually measure the thing. Double check, if we didn't double check, we may have gone down you know, a route. Don't necessarily believe any instructions you have. Yes, they can be handy, but they might also lead you uh, down the garden path as well. Got to have your thinking cap on. And with these intermittent faults, don't just go around with, you know, a theory in your head. Oh yeah, it's the primary side contacts and start cleaning all the contacts and going, oh yeah, I fixed it because Murphy will bloody well get you. I guarantee it that it'll, you know, it'll look fixed. It'll work for a week or whatever. And then the thing will come back. But we got reasonably lucky on this one that it decided to sort of play ball. But it may not have. This one could have been really ugly. So we made a couple of assumptions in here, came up with a couple of theories, but we tried to verify them. And then, hey, I was wrong. You know, it wasn't the primary side. Hey, but it was worth a quick, you know, 30 second look just to measure it and make sure. But hey, we found it pointed somewhere else. And then that pointed to another thing. And bingo, we found it. Beauty. Never assume. And also, this is not a bad example of where having multiple multimeters comes in handy and potentially, even though we didn't get that far, having a multi-channel scope. A lot of people ask, well, what use is a four-channel scope? Well, you can measure four power supplies at the same time and see what they're doing and capture uh, transients. We had some weird 
you know, fire your boat, we may have gone down into that detail and maybe even because these are ground reference, maybe you might have needed a, uh, we didn't get this far either, but you might have needed a nice uh, multi-channel isolated uh, scope like this one. Uh, two channels, hopefully do a repair and tear down on this one too um, soon. Uh, two um, isolated uh, channels so that we can get in there and uh, and probe different uh, points at the same time, fully isolated from any uh, reference between uh, scopes. So yeah, it's handy to have more than one meter. I keep saying it. Good example. Hope you enjoyed that. That was a bloody ripper. I love a good adventure hunt like that. So I hope you did too. If you want to discuss it, jump on over to the EEV blog forum. Links down below, all that sort of stuff. I've got the warranty void if not removed t-shirt. I'll probably link in that down below if I remember. I usually don't. Anyway, leave YouTube comments, blog comments, all that sort of jazz. Catch you next time.